Tonight we're in Ipswich, and this is Question Time. Good evening and welcome, whether you're watching on television, listening on Radio 5 Live, here in the audience, welcome to our panel. Tonight, the former leader of the Labour Party, Ed Miliband, in his first appearance on Question Time since last year's election. The Conservative former Europe Minister and Chairman of the Party, campaigning for Brexit, David Davis. The Green Party's former and maybe future leader, Caroline Lucas. David Cameron's close political ally for many years, maybe slightly less now that he's urging Brexit, Steve Hilton. And the crime writer with nine novels to her credit and a Guardian columnist to boot, Drida Say Mitchell. Good, thank you very much. And just before we take our first question, remember, as ever, Facebook, Twitter, texting 83981. If you want to comment on anything that's said here, do that and everybody will get to uh, hear your views. Now, if I can find the questions which I have. Our first question tonight is from Mary Bird, please. Mary Bird. Hello. In light of the EU migration figures published today, how on earth are our public services going to cope? Ed Miliband. Well, Mary, I think they can cope, um, but I think it obviously means that there are stresses and strains. And this goes to the bigger question of whether we should obviously be within the e European Union, remain or leave. I, I understand people have concerns about immigration, but I think you've got to look at the balance of the argument here. And it seems to me the balance of the argument is this. We know from official figures that people who come here from the European Union contribute about two and a half billion pounds more in terms of taxes than they claim in benefits. We know we've got 100,000 people from the EU working in our public services, which you asked about. Now, on the other side, there are... The I'm talking about schools, hospitals, yeah. you and know, the transport yeah, system. Yeah, and That's a, what I'm talking yeah, about. And there are two, there They're are two, heaving. And there are 250,000 people from the EU propping up our schools and our hospitals and our social care system. And, and look, but, but, but Mary, but Mary I, I hear it in my own constituency. I don't deny that there are pressures, but I ask you and the audience to think about this. First of all, economically, we are better off in the European Union. The Institute of Fiscal Studies, a respected independent think tank, not the government, not the governor of the Bank of England, said this week, there will be a 20 to 40 billion pound black hole in our public finances if we left. Now, the question for you and for the audience is, and this is, I think, the answer, let's use the money that we get from being in the European Union, the extra taxes, to relieve the pressures on public services in Ipswich and elsewhere. But for goodness sake, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater, well, what, leave the European Union yeah. and make us worse but, off, because that's, but, I believe, what would happen. You haven't talked... No. On, on the Remain side, just briefly, are you embarrassed by the figures that came out showing the second highest on record no. this year? Today? You're not embarrassed by it? You don't think it's em difficult for, for, well, well, for no. the campaign, no? No. no. All right, look, fine. Look, That's a, no, I but, no, but I think it's an important point, because, look, yeah, I'm the son right. of immigrants. My parents came here as refugees from the Nazis, right? From Europe. From Belgium, my dad in 1940. From Mum, my Poland, in, from Poland after the Second World War. Right? They were European migrants. They've made a contribution okay. to this country. Right. And look, so I think immigration has benefits. I think people make contributions. Now, we've got to use the extra income generated to relieve the pressures that yeah. people here you, and elsewhere you, you, face. You've said that. David Davis. Well, you should be worried. I mean, this, this country has been welcoming to migrants for decades, centuries, as, as indeed Ed indicates, but welcoming to them in numbers which we can cope with and 300 and odd thousand net migration every year, a new city every year, the question is quite right, Mary is quite right. It overwhelms the ability of schools, hospitals, housing, which we cannot change very fast, uh, is overwhelmed. Young people can't afford houses as a result. Ed says it makes more money. Well, I'm afraid these numbers don't stand up. Uh, those numbers are based on, on the very real and proper uh, uh, calculation 
that most migrants come here to work. They don't come here to be on dependent on benefits. And so that calculation on how much benefits claimed, how much tax is paid, on that basis is right. But that doesn't take on board all the extra public services. It doesn't take on board all the extra transport. It doesn't take on board all the other pressures on society that it creates. And that's not the fault of the migrant. If I were a Romanian, I'd be here now. If I were a, a Greek, a uh, young Greek, I'd be here now because this is where the jobs are. But it's the government's responsibility and this is out of control. Full stop. This is out of control. <laughs> and what the government ought to, be, to do is to get this back in control for the interests of the country and, frankly, also for the interests of many of the migrants. And the only way that can be done is by leaving the European Union. To give us <laughs> Well, in economic terms alone, if you leave the European Union, you are looking at a massive loss of uh, economic wealth to this country. You're looking at a loss of jobs. And we can argue how much that figure is, and there are very different estimates out there. But when you've got everybody from the OECD to the IMF to the Bank of England, all of them saying that there will be a net economic loss to Britain if we leave the single market, then I think that's something that should give us pause. But, you know, I don't want to sit here apologizing for the fact that membership of the EU gives us free movement of people. I want to sit here and actually celebrate it. And I appreciate that that might be controversial. <laughs> but I think, I think there is something rather amazing about having the choice for those people that do have a choice to be able to live and love and work and retire in 28 different member states. And we know, of course, that many British, British people make the most of that by going to Spain and many other parts of the, of the EU, just as people come to our country. Now, I do accept that the costs and benefits are not terribly equally spread across the UK, which is why I agree with Ed that we need some kind of immigration dividend or a solidarity fund, whatever we want to call it. But given that there is a net benefit that people are bringing, not just in terms of, of, of their benefit in terms of our communities and our culture, but that net economic benefit, then let us use that money to be able to invest in the services in those areas that are under particular so pressure. So you think, in reply to Mary, your view is that the public services can be funded properly? I think if the political will is there, of course they could be funded properly, but we can also look at right. parts of the country where right now we, we, we have such a centralisation in London and the South East that that puts pressure irrespective of, of, right. of immigration. Let if we had a more balanced regional policy across the country, I think we could make, you know, have all of the benefits and have much less Let pressure. Let's hear from well. some members of the audience, then I'll come to our, back to our panel. <laughs> look, look, the woman there in, 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 in orange there, or pink, is it there? You, you ma'am, yeah. Is it because the economic union is not working, the U European Union is not working, uh, that there are so many people that are uh, out of work in Europe, it's, it's a broken club that so many people are actually coming to Britain. You think that Britain. The, the outfit isn't, isn't delivering? Yeah. All right, well, let's hold on to that point. And you're in the blue shirt there on the, on the gangway. Hold on a second, we get a microphone to you. Right. I don't think the debate about immigration in the EU should be about numbers or immigrants' economic, if they benefit the UK or not. It should be about the choice and if we have the choice uh, to control our immigration policy. Even if we left the EU, we could then choose whether or not we had mass migration. If we, want, if we elected a government with a policy of immigration of hundreds of thousands, then fine. But at the minute, as a member of the EU, we don't have that choice. Okay. Steve Hilton. Uh, like Ed, I'm very uh, pro-immigration, and I suspect also, because like Ed, my uh, parents were immigrants to this country, I owe everything I have, all my opportunities, to the fact that this country welcomed my parents. I'm also an immigrant now from this country to America, so I am very pro-immigration. But precisely because of that, I think we should be completely open on immigration. And let me explain what I mean by that. It's clearly common sense that we can't have unlimited numbers of people coming to this country. We all agree there has to be a limit. There has to be a certain number beyond which it's not sustainable, as we've heard. So the question is, who comes within that limit? What we have right now, through being in the EU, is a situation where we have unlimited numbers of people coming from Europe without any say or control over it. What that means is that actually we're shutting the doors to people from beyond Europe 
that could be fantastically valuable contributors to our economy and our society, people from China or, or India or entrepreneurs and scientists from all around the world who are shut out because we have to take, as I've put it, unlimited numbers of Hungarian waiters. Now, I've got nothing against Hungarians because I am one. But the truth is, we should be able to decide who comes to our country. That should be a choice for us. And as long as we're in the EU, it's a choice we can't make. So you're I saying think the that wrong kind of immigrants are coming. That's I think really it's what a you're fundamentally, saying. Is that, is that right? I think it's a fundamentally undemocratic situation where something as important as this is out of our control. I have a problem. <laughs> I'm with you completely, you know, we're all here, it seems like we're all the, the children of, of, of migrants, but when my parents came here in the 60s, I would say they were quite unskilled, so are you saying that my parents shouldn't have come here? Because they weren't a doctor, they weren't a nurse, they, my da my, both my parents left school before they were, my dad left school before he was 15, would you bar the door to my dad? I think that we need to have a... We, it's a, it's a great question, and I think what it, the answer to the question is that we need to discuss it, we need to have a policy on it, and we need to be able as a country to come to a view about the answer to that question. And it will always be the case, I hope, that this country welcomes people who need refuge from things that are going on around the world that are... That are but I, I also think, you know, from but it does, the question as well, as I think, I, I hear what people are saying, but I also think if you're talking about the pressure on services, you have to dig deeper and talk about those services. So, for example, with education, what we know is happening at the moment is we've got a massive shortage in terms of teachers. We've got teachers leaving the profession whole scale. Every time I meet a former colleague, I used to teach in schools for nearly 20 years, they've all left. So that's a big issue. Another issue is in terms of the NHS. Why is it there have been huge cutbacks in terms of training for, for, for nurses. So we can't keep blaming migrants. There are lots of issues that are running parallel to each other, and I agree with you, but we can't just have a policy about migration. If you're talking about public services, you've got to have a big overarching policy mm. that looks at all but Drida, the what is your What is your view on migration? Do you think it, uh, from the EU it should be unlimited? I think, you know, because my whole thing about being um, on voting for leave is I've got a real issue with the EU and, and democracy. Um, I think it should be a democratically elected government, we live in a democracy, and they should have the right, like with all other big policies, to choose what their migration policy is. I think it's wrong that somebody else chooses that. Okay. Caroline? Well, just when it comes to... Well, can you deal with well, that, that yes, point, well, that when it's it comes wrong, to wrong somebody else decides? Well, I, I, I'm saying that uh, the EU is made up of the Council of Ministers, where we do have our ministers sitting there on behalf of the UK. We also have members of the European but Parliament. But it's and the they EU are, Commission, they are which elected. is not... The EU have, Commission is not elected. They're no, appointed. but the Commission and is the civil service. Commission. No, but the EU no, Commission, not. nothing seems to happen yes, without is. them. No, no, they have to kick started. Can I just finish? Have you been because to one of those meetings and seen what goes on? I used to be a member of the European Parliament for 10 the, years, and I've Council seen up close what goes on. And I can tell you that essentially there is more democracy, in right, ironically, on. in the EU than there is here. At least your members of the European Parliament are elected through a system of proportional representation. Oh. We have a government here elected on 24% of the eligible vote. The idea that that is somehow democracy is a complete travesty. OK, Steve, you've obviously been in or sat I've in the Council of Ministers, them. have you? I you have. Observed. I've Tell observed about them. it. First of all, I absolutely agree with Caroline that there are serious problems that we need to fix in our democracy. I Good. completely agree with that. Could you have a I word with David Cameron about it? That would be really helpful. I've, I've, had had him, many, him many, I've had many words over the years on that topic as well as others. Um, the, the point is that to, in the EU, obviously, when the whole thing is run basically um, on a committee basis where you have 28 countries and probably more, everything is a negotiation and that means that Everything has to be a compromise. Now, there's nothing wrong with compromise. Life is about compromise. Government is about compromise. But the truth is, it should be the case that the compromises are ones that we can get involved in, that the people affected by those compromises can have a say over what is the result. And that is impossible if we're in the EU. OK. The, the woman there on the other side. Yes. 
the, returning to the original question, yes. um, GP practices within Ipswich are having to close their lists because they are unable to take any more patients because of the, they, they have so many deep problems. One of those problems, and a very serious part of those problems, are the number of EU migrants that are in Ipswich. It's a, it, the, the, they can't cope with the language difficulties, the numbers. It's, it's just the, the system is folding. And, and you're locally. talking of, of patients, not of nurses and doctors. Patients, patients. the number of patients that they have. Right, they're overwhelmed by. Yeah. It. Okay. I want to hear from somebody who's pro remain on this point about immigration. Yes, all right, you. I work for the NHS. Um, I worked in Colchester since I, was, uh, since I left school. Blaming immigration uh, on the shortfalls of the NHS is not true. Exactly. The, the, the NHS is struggling because of the Conservative government cuts made to the NHS, not because of immigration. So, David, it's the Conservatives' fault. Ah, well, it's always the Conservatives' fault, isn't it? The, the, the simple truth... Look, we were, talk, we were talking about the pressures brought about by immigration, and we are also talking about democracy. Now, let's start with getting a few facts straight. I mean, I was there for a few years. Uh, Caroline's wrong. The Commission is the government. The government in any country is the one that initiates the legislation, right, right. starts the ball rolling, writes the Act of Parliament, it's the commissioners that do that. Yeah. And how do we choose the commissioners? We choose people who their electorates have rejected. Jean Claude Juncker yeah. it was, it was rejected. I appointed Neil Kinnock, you know? He was another one who the electorate rejected. You know? so, so let's be clear, you know, this is not a democracy. Why did but, you appoint but, somebody who'd been rejected? Then? Because, Why did you make because, a better because, choice? Because, you thought it was the wrong choice. No, no it was the right choice. Because, oh, it was the right choice. No, listen, listen. Well, hang on a moment. You can't no, say no, it's the right listen. choice and then he say the thing doesn't the work. Only way, the only the way... The right could, undemocratic it, choice. It's, it's a, yeah, you, you, haven't so, got any, you haven't got any option. You can't elect a commissioner, David. You're not allowed to. The government nominates them. It nominates one, in those days, one from each party. And the Labour Party nominated for me, and I said, we can't block the Labour Party, let's do it. But let's okay. come back to the point. The point here is about democracy. Now, who knows best what our public services can deal with? Who knows best how many nurses we need? Who knows best how many houses we can build? Our government. Not some commissioner in Brussels, our government. Which, is why, we, which is why we should control the number of immigration and where they come from and okay. who they are. I do say that the people who are for leave in this argument, I, I fear, are selling an illusion. Because I, I just want to say to this audience, the problems we face as a country, not just migration, climate change, terrorism, tax avoidance, all of those issues, we can't deal with them on our own anymore. Oh, We've got to... Let me... Let me... Let me, let, me explain, let me explain what I mean by that. The truth is, these problems cross borders. Powerful corporations cross borders. Oh, and we are much stronger... It's all about and we are much, Here we go. It, it's always about big business, corporations. Well, well, are we you, actually saying, what? David, that we as a country with the fifth largest... Ed, decod Sorry. Yeah. Ed. <laughs> <laughs> I interrupted um, your stride for a moment. Um, I have the, the same problem. The fifth so largest. <laughs> My mum makes the same mistake. Fifth largest, <laughs> we're the fifth largest economy. Are we actually saying we cannot do this on our no, own? But we've got Working to, in partnership I, I with other people. Don't have to exactly. be here. Exactly, exactly, you said it exactly right, Reda, at the end. Working in partnership Not in with union. other people. We, we're but in a partnership with the United States. Are we in a union with no, them? No, 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 no we're not. But let me just, let's take a All very right. concrete example here. So we don't right? need to be. We have four weeks paid holiday in this country. We have equal rights for men and women. Not enough, but we've made progress on it. We have maternity leave. Those things didn't happen because of a Conservative government or a Labour government. They happened because across the European Union, you had countries joining together saying, we're not going to let com uh, companies play one country off against another, reduce the rights. The same on the environment. 
Uh, and actually, we were able to deliver those things. And actually, but we're we're also talking about the right, country. Right, no, right, we also right, live I, at a time just, right. when we've got Drina, zero just, contracts just, as well. Yeah, is we that good? Okay, is Drina, that good? Drina, what are you I tried doing to get about rid of that? that? Drina, but, hold on a second. But it's not happened, I've got a lot of people in the audience want to speak, and I want to hear from them. Hold on a second. And Steve Hilton has got a comment on the... Look, I've only been here since Monday, OK? And I'm already absolutely sick of hearing from the Remain side these silly scares and phony figures yeah. and overstatements of what people are saying. <laughs> for, Ed, for Ed... Wait. Coming from the no, other side. Ed, that is the most on, rich wait, wait, thing. You coming let from me finish your the side point. of the debate, me that is the, the richest point, criticism I could ever imagine. For Ed... Your side of the debate. For Ed, to say what he just did, to present this as a choice between total isolation mm. Mm. and cooperation in Europe is completely ridiculous. Of course it's true that we need to cooperate on things like the environment and terrorism and global issues. No, and of no, course no, it's true that we can no, do that outside the EU as an independent country. So this is a really serious debate. It's complicated and there are many sides to it. And I wish that the Remain side would just stop simplifying it and treating people like they can't understand complicated arguments. All right. Uh, we've got, we've got, we've got, uh, we've got more questions about Europe, and I come to them. But I'll just take one or two more members of the audience. You there, first of all. Um, the largest comment against sort of remaining within the EU seems to be all of this red tape, all of this democracy that isn't happening. I just want to say. I'm not sure if I actually want to hand back more power to the government that has made £12 million pounds worth of cuts to welfare, that has seen child poverty rise by, you know, 500 million or 500,000. I, I just don't want to see that. It doesn't seem like if they get all this power, they'll be doing things that are for the people. You think I think it's, they need someone to answer to. Are you, saying, are you saying, in effect, you, you feel safer in, in the EU rather well, than Like the non-discrimination and gender equality laws that were spoken about, right. how do we know that our government is going to protect those? And you're also, I don't trust them to do for the people. And you are I don't absolutely want them to have right. more power. You are absolutely okay. right. You, the woman in orange there, please. please. The woman in orange there, yes. The whole nub of the EU referendum is not the economy. It's not migration. We've got to consider what it's truly about, what's at the heart of the referendum, is do we want to govern ourselves? I've got a question about the economy that I want to come to next, but let me take you in the check shirt there, sir. Ca Caroline, wasn't your, um, your, your answer in your first um, response to do with disproportionality. So you talked about the South East and London having a great strain on its services. If you lift, lift that up, argument up one level, aren't you arguing with yourself because we are part of Europe and there's a disproportional number of people coming to this country? No, I, I think that, that people are going to many different countries of the EU and the point I'm making is about subsidiarity. It's about where power and democracy need to lie. And there are certain things that absolutely need to be done at EU level um, in terms of tackling the environment, in terms of tackling the issues of common workers' rights, and that's why we need the EU. This idea that governing ourselves means that essentially that we are taking our back so home, we think we're democracy. going to be able to... Do you not believe in democracy? It's because Evidently I believe not. in democracy <laughs> that I'm supporting the, the EU right. where there are issues that we cannot right. solve on our own. Take right. air pollution. Right. Right. Air right. pollution right. Let's, in let's end this section. From let's end this. Let's end this. Other we've, had so we've, had really we've had 25 minutes on this. We've got other questions on you. I want to come to them. We had, we've had quite a lot of people from the Brexit side. Anybody from the Remain side who wants to comment? You do. There, the man there. Yes. And you so do. Like... Yeah. You're a Remainer, are you? I am, yes. All right, just... On I'd what like, you've heard, what do you say? I'd like to say that I believe Brexit have done a great job in actually pointing the finger, wagging it solely at the uh, EU migration situation. 333,000 was the net figure today, of which 150,000 was from outside the EU. So if the hospitals are overflowing, why did we let in 150,000? And the second point is, the big danger here is when we, if we pull out of the EU, there is nothing to stop illegal immigration numbers rising because there'll be nothing to stop anyone in the EU just saying if you want to go to the UK just camp out in Calais, camp out in Amsterdam and just come across to Clacton anytime you like. Okay and another uh, thank you and another point from somebody who is a Remainer. 
You're a Remainer, sir. You're a Remainer there, the woman there on the end? Yes. Yeah, just coming back to the original question yes. about, prop about services, yeah. I completely agree with Ed that migrants prop up our services. I recently very badly injured my shoulder. About 80% of the medical professionals I've dealt with have been not from this country. If those people had not been in the NHS, I would have had to wait a lot longer to receive the treatment that I've had. So okay. they do prop up our services and they make a massive contribution and we will miss out on that if we leave. Thank you. Right, we're going to... But before, before we take the next question, let me just explain Question Time's progress um, in the next two or three weeks. We're going to be in Cardiff next week. Uh, we're going to be in Folkestone the week after that. But in the final week before the vote, we've actually got a special series of three programmes, Nottingham, York and Milton Keynes. Um, in Nottingham, Michael Gove is going to be facing a Question Time audience. <laughs> <laughs> can't get through these things. Michael Gove is going to be facing a question time audience on his own. In Milton Keynes, David Cameron is going to be facing a question time audience on his own. And uh, in whatever's left, York, we're going to have a normal panel. Uh, well, I say normal panel, we're going to have a, a big panel with the audience. So there's a Cardiff Folkestone. Nottingham, York and Milton Keynes. I'll give the numbers at the end, but they're on the screen now if you want to make a note, if you'd like to come to either of any of those um, programmes. Right, let's go on. Uh, they're not necessarily very, very far. Claudette Jones, please. Claudette. Um, is it worth another two years of austerity to leave the EU? Is it worth another two... This was the claim that there was going to be two years of austerity by the IFS, I think. Is your view it is worth it or not worth it? I'm currently undecided um, because there's so many forecasts that have come out and it's difficult to know who's to believe, especially when forecasts have to be based on a certain amount of assumption and we, because we don't know what, what Europe is going to decide, how they're going to behave towards us if we do leave, it's quite difficult to, to know what... All right, well, let, let's have a try with our panel. David Davis, the IFS, as you know, yes. uh, an, an, an organisation that Michael Gove said he had the greatest respect for. Um, Not anymore. Uh, had, uh, <laughs> said there'd be an additional year or two of austerity. Well, they're just, they're just wrong. They didn't do any work of their own. What they did was look at all the other surveys that had been taking place. And I'm afraid the, the establishment, the international establishment in particular, is caught in a sort of group think. These are the people, remember, who were all in favour of the euro, the IMF and the Treasury and all that. They, were, uh, they never saw the, uh, the 2008 financial crisis coming. In fact, they helped cause it. You know? uh, the, uh, the IMF in particular didn't, didn't even handle the Greek crisis very well. These are people who are holding themselves up as authorities. The Treasury tried to stop us going into the euro. Uh, eventually. After, no, but after, I mean, they wait, made wait, the wait, conditions wait, that, that no, no, stopped minute, Brown no, no, going in. No, no, wait a minute. The, I mean, stop, yeah, no, stop I, Blair going yet in. Yet again, I was there, you weren't. The simple yeah. truth is, yeah. Ooh. The, Ooh. The, Ooh. The, Ooh. I read the papers. <laughs> well, yeah, you read some Sorry. Of well, wait, wait, yeah, wait you, a minute. All right. Well, if you challenge me, let me just I say will, my, my understanding of the then. story. I, I was uh, there, and there actually, and you were there. Which was that the, the, there was a were feeling that Tony yeah. Blair wanted to go into the euro that Gordon Brown didn't. It's true. Isn't More it? or less true. Yeah. More or less true. And the Treasury came up with the yeah. conditions. The, right. the opt-out in the first place was created by John Major's government many years before. He wouldn't have had the choice had not been for them. And the reason the opt-out was created was because of the mistake made by the Treasury on the ERM. Remember the ERM crisis? That's what led to that. That was another mistake these people made. But now, you say the Treasury no, no, wanted us to go into the Euro, is what you said. No, you now. said that. No, I didn't say that. You said no, no, that. No, I said these people wanted it. Now, included now, the Treasury. The, the, well, this, this, this grant. Now, call it the, a draw. No, we won't call it a draw. <laughs> I haven't finished yet. Now, the, the, <laughs> the, the simple truth here is that the assumption being made behind all of these gloomy, uh, uh, sort of frightening stories is that one, we're going to lose lots of trade with the European Union and two, we're not going to do any trade outside or any more trade outside in the global world. Firstly, the, of course we're going to get lots of scare stories right up to the day of Brexit. But go out in the street, look at the cars, count the cars, how many Audis, how many BMWs, how many Mercedes, how many Volkswagens. Germany needs us, we're our biggest, its biggest market. France needs us for wine and cheese. The deal will be done. 
in the next two years. That's the first thing. Second thing, in terms of global trade, the worst operator in terms of creating free trade areas in the world is the European Union. It hasn't got to deal with the United States yet. It hasn't got to deal with China. It hasn't got to deal with India. It tried for nearly 10 years to get a deal with India. It took nine years to get a deal with Canada. Everybody else can do this in, in months or, or, or one or two years. Other small countries can do it. Switzerland can do it. Uh, South Korea can do it. So the argument that we are going to suffer is a scare story based on a falsehood. So to come back to your point... <laughs> A, 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 man, a man called Stuart Rose, who is the business leader of the Remain campaign, was interviewed in front of a select committee, and uh, one, one of the House of Commons select committees. And one of the things he admitted was that not, nothing would change very much at all for the first couple of years anyway. Secondly, he admitted that actually wages would go up if we left the European Union. Now, those two things to me do not argue for a great recession or a great penalty right. we have to face if we leave the Union. Okay. And I come back to the point, we're leaving, or we, we, we should leave, because of recovering control of our own affairs, and we'll run them better than they do. All right. That does not include Thank a you. recession. Ed, Mil Ed Miliband, the... Um, <laughs> the Chancellor this week said uh, that Brexit would cost as many as 820,000 jobs. Mm. And the Treasury said that by 2030, Britain will be worse off by over £4,000 a year per household. You've mm. heard what David Davis says. Do you support those contentions? Do you believe them? Yeah, I mean, they're in the broad range of, con of, of conjectures and forecasts made. But oh, so just... What does a broad range mean? You mean it may be true, it may not be true? Well, no, but look, <laughs> well, every respected independent forecaster has said we're going to be worse off economically, worse off for trade, worse off for investment. I just want to say something about the Institute for Fiscal Studies came out with the report this week. They have criticised Labour governments. They have criticised Conservative governments. Always after a budget, they say the Chancellor got this wrong, got that wrong. The idea that they're part of a vast conspiracy on the Remain side is frankly laughable, David. This is an independent body that is saying we're going to be worse off. But I also want to go to Claudette's question. But actually, Claudette said, is two years austerity, which the IFS said would happen, worth it? Well, my argument is it isn't worth it. Yes, and it and let me just say one thing about why I think it's not worth it, and it's about young people. All around the world, young people are kicking against the system. So you might expect in this referendum, to the forecast, the polls to be saying that young people will be voting for out. They're voting for in. Now, I think we should think about the wisdom of young people in this. Why is that? Because young people like the freedom to travel. They recognise the world is getting closer together. They recognise that we need to work with others to tackle the challenges. Which young people so are you talking be... about? Well, Which uh, young people? Young people this, is my, this, this is my problem sometimes. Sometimes when we use the term young people, we're invariably talking about young people who were students, who were part of the professional class. No, no I'm not talking think, about that. No. I don't think... Let me tell you. I don't think Let me tell you. No, they... Oh, Ed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just go with you, you there, actually. That would be, that'd be sort of easier. Um, <sighs> They'll edit that bit out, anyway. Uh, we never edit think, this programme. <laughs> You're on guard. I want to come so to you in a moment, because you keep finished. interfering, oh. interrupting. Yeah. The, yes, yeah, sorry. I, come I, to you. Well, no. I was interrupted, actually. No, 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 I'm talking to the man there with the medals oh. on. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I just think there's no, a the whole thing about... No, my basic no, no, point no, about I, young I, people... I'm still talking, yeah. Ed. Um, <laughs> is about working class people. No. You know, I don't know. I'm thinking about the working class people no, in yeah. my family. They're not talking about, yeah, I can't wait to travel, to go off to, to Greece or Milan or wherever, Rotterdam, to set up some business. What they want, what preoccupies them is, am I going to have a steady yeah. job? Am I going to have a roof over my head? Yeah. Am I going to have somewhere exactly. where I come home to my family? Exactly. Am I going to have time to chill out? And relax. So can we stop using this general term, young people? No, but I'm making a very and specific using a point. Very stereotypical I'm a, no, image it's not of stereotypical. I'm making a very specific point. Now I've learned not to trust polls, but I, I can say <laughs> that, 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 that if you look at the broad range of the polls, by three or four to one, young people, and that's very large margins, are saying we should stay in. Now that's because they can't imagine a world where we can't have visa-free travel across the 28 countries, or, or where. Well, we didn't have it before, actually. But we didn't have it before. Yes, but, we did. But the, 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 tr the, the truth is that I think... So, I, I, go on. Let's, let's hear your point. 
Before, before the EU? Before, before Poland and the East European countries joined the European Union, you could travel without a visa. It's not a problem. Europe you can travel to the States without a visa. What you can travel Europe? to Japan, Dubai without a visa. You don't need a visa. Eastern, Eastern Europe, you, you couldn't travel. You go to France the, without a visa. Not to the 28 well, countries of the European Union. You go to Union. Germany without a visa. You never needed a visa mm. for Italy. No, no but to no, the 28 never. countries of the European Union. I want to go to you, sir, because you are disagreeing. I noticed you with the woman on your Thank right you. about this. And the question was, is it worth another two years of austerity to leave the EU? And you said, yes, it is, yes, very forcefully. You think it is worth it? Yes, it is. OK. So, so on the, you're not moved by the economic argument? Well, may I say, David, um, as an ex-serviceman, Her Majesty's Armed Forces, I'm a veteran, uh, as you can see. I serve my Queen and country, and I am actually living proof I will be uh, voting to leave the EU along with a lot of servicemen and ex-servicemen because I am living proof that being part of this EU does not work for people that are not of, in receipt of senior citizen pensions. If you cannot work, I couldn't work. I lived in Spain since approximately 2000. I was forced back to my country and I have it on a, a, a digi recording from uh, a top social security politician Malcolm, you are English. Go back to England. We cannot afford to keep you and help you anymore. I had to leave my home behind and my wife-to-be. I can't bring her back to the country, this country with me because she comes from Ukraine. And there's a lot of paperwork and, and money so you're, needed to you're, do that. So you, you're saying was, to, to when help I with went the into, EU? When I went into the medical centre for my, for my right. morphine, yeah. there was a red cross put on the back of this uh, uh, Spanish SIP card and said it's not valued anymore, you're going to have to pay privately because you are not of pensionable age. And I, amongst a lot of former military people and serving military people, will be voting to go out. All right. Caroline Lucas. Can you, do you recognise that? Oh, well, hold on, hold on. No, no, we've we've heard the story. To us yeah. a load of rubbish. I yeah. am living proof. I, yes. It they was, do not treat us as European people. Right. We are not Car equals. Caroline Lucas, do you come across that kind of story? I, I, from... I genuinely haven't come across that kind no. of story. I'm very sorry to hear it, but I don't know that uh, leaving the EU would actually make it any better. But I wanted to come to the point that Dreda made, because it's an important one, where she says that the young people she knows are most concerned about whether or not they're going to have a secure job, whether they can put food on the table and so on. And it's exactly for those reasons that I think we need to stay inside the EU, because that's how you get, for example, basic workers' rights guaranteed, not just in the UK, but right across the EU. So you don't have but big corporations... Let me just finish, because you were yeah, able to course. speak earlier. Okay. They don't get corporations trying to play off one country against the other and bring down standards. If you have your friends who are perhaps agency workers, then it's because of the EU that you've got common protection for agency workers. If they were pregnant, then they're going to have better re results as a result of, of, of the EU in terms of protections for them. So it seems to me that... You know, the EU has done a huge amount to make sure that working people are going to be better protected. Don't forget that Boris Johnson wants to scrap the social chapter. He wants to scrap all of those protections. He has said, Boris Johnson has absolutely said, he wants to get rid of it. Yes, I will come to you, but Steve Hilton. Um, the Prime Minister says family holidays are going to rise by £230. You've heard all the other figures. Yep. Do you think they're all rubbish? Um, yes. Uh, yes, basically. I think, a bit but slow I, on that one. Bit, well, <laughs> you don't have to speak for I'm him. Honest, <laughs> I've, uh, I, you know, I've, I've, I've said already that I'm, I'm, I think I'm sick. I think we're all sick of these, these sort of phony figures. I want to come back to the question, because you used a phrase that I think really is at the heart of this, this discussion about what's going to happen. Uh, the phrase you used was, you hear all this stuff and it's difficult to know. Those were your words. That's right, and I'd go a bit further. It's impossible to know. It's literally impossible to know exactly what's going to happen in the future. Now, I'm very clearly for leave, but I would be the first to acknowledge that there are risks from leaving. But please could the other side of the argument also acknowledge that there are also risks from staying. Because the EU right now, for example, is one of the worst performing economic areas in the world. It's basically a sinking ship economically. There's a risk to us from being associated with that. The truth is, the future is a risk. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. And not just the next few years, but the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. We have no idea what's going to happen. So the real question, given that it's difficult, impossible to know, is what kind of arrangements for governing ourselves, put us in the best possible position to cope with these future risks. 
And for me, the answer to that question is a set of arrangements for running the country that allow us to, to move quickly to address things as they happen and to have control over the things that we want to do in our country and not have to move at the pace of a committee of 20-odd other countries and negotiate everything so that we can respond to an uncertain future in the decades ahead. And that's why I think we should leave. Has he, has, he, has, he, has he won you over with that one or not? I think we've got a lot more information about the risks that we would face if we stayed in than those that we would face if we left. It feels like an enormous unknown. Okay. And so. Let's hear from some more members of the audience. You, sir, there. Um, hopefully I can weigh in because as a young person who's uh, I'm in my final year of A-level, so hoping to go to university, I think when you hear Remain politicians saying the young people, they don't really understand. I'm from Felixstowe, which is a port town, and we can see the direct effects of all this mass immigration. You know, my town doesn't look like what it used to. And I think one thing, Mr. Melman, that you seem to be forgetting is we have the Commonwealth, which is now a bigger trading bloc than the European <laughs> Union. And, as the man said over here, most of the countries there are loyal to our Queen. They have the same culture as we do, the same principles. And as someone whose step-grandfather is from the Caribbean who came over here to work, and I, went, I had the pleasure to go out and visit the country of St. Vincent, I can tell you that they understand how we are act as a nation and we should feel fine about leaving the, United, uh, sorry, the European Union because we have the a, Commonwealth. Yes, because the Commonwealth is uh, there to look after briefly, us. Briefly, Edmund Van, if you would, just well, answer I, that point. I think the interesting thing is that actually other countries want us to be in the European Union because liaising with us and trading with us, they then get a 500 million person market. So I don't think it's a choice between being involved with the Commonwealth or being involved with the European Union, we should do both. Just like we should reach out to China and be in the European Union. But lots of these other countries think one of the reasons they can trade with us is we're in the EU, not outside it. Okay, you said the back there. I feel that um, David Davis is, like all Brexiters, is willfully distorting the economic picture. Of course we'll be able to <laughs> trade with the company, countries in the EU, but we'll have to pay tariffs. Exactly. All products will be more expensive for us. Also, our companies, our businesses which trade in Europe, like financial services, will have huge restrictions put on them, which will cause huge trouble to our underlying economy, which will make all our public services less able to cope with the problems that they already have. And this is all for this sort of what the, the kind of unknown um, benefit of having of us being in control and they say that the, he says he wants to be in control of immigration but there's no saying what the government of the time will do about immigration okay we could be in or out of Europe we could have just as much immigration so we should stay in and retain the benefits David <laughs> The, the, first, the first thing to understand is there is no free market in services in the European Union. They still haven't got one after all these years. So Absolute that's, rubbish. That's the first the, thing to the, say. The, the second... The no, second no, 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 just... He said it was rubbish, so just well, briefly, why is it rubbish? Maybe rubbish is true, but we, the government, both the Labour and Conservative government, spent a long time ensuring that the EU did not push, push down um, the city, they did not impose... EU-wide extra taxations on financial services which would have benefited other financial centres in the EU to the detriment of the city. There are ways in which being out of the EU will hugely affect the financial services industry to a degree that is far greater than all the so-called benefits on the other side. Right. No, I reiterate sector. my point. Right. There, yeah, there, is, there is no free market in services. And, and th that negotiation you talked about, I mean, it, you can pick lots of them if you like. I mean, when, the, when, the, when they had to bail out Greece, we were supposedly not supposed to be involved in it. We ended up paying out 840, 850 million pounds as a result of being inside the system. More at the point, and, and I think more importantly in this argument, is this whole question of whether or not we continue to have access. And I reiterate the point. If we are outside the single market, 
we will have a deal with them, just as many other countries do, a free, a free trade but deal. Will, but it but will what, have tariffs, David. What, it will have tariffs unless you're part of the single market. No, it will have tariffs. tariffs. Yes, it will. The, if, you, if, you had, if you had what's called the World Trade Organization arrangements, the tariffs would go in both directions. Yes. They would be far more penal to the German car industry, which sells a million cars a year here, than they would be to us. And the most powerful person in Europe is Angela Merkel. And she's got a general election in 2017. But even and Angela Miss, Merkel Miss, cannot and, make and, a bilateral wait a minute, agreement. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, eventually, in, eventually in the European Union, what Germany wants, Germany gets, I'm afraid. And what, there's also an election mm. in France in 2017. They'll have the same issue with agricultural sales to us. Mm. So on that side, the argument is a very ill thought through one, if I forgive David, can I just interrupt you? Hang on. Yeah. The head of the World Trade Organization said the UK would face an extra £9 billion in trading costs mm. if it left the EU. Was reported as well, he's, he's is making, he right or wrong? He's, or no, he's wrong. He's making a guess about what's going to be the outcome of the negotiation. Everybody this negotiation David, is, you cannot is, say. Now, can I just finish the argument? The, 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 this negotiation is two, two years at least to go through. Uh, there's going to be, of course, in the first few months, there's going to be a degree of hysteria. There, there will be. There's no doubt about that. But then all of these countries have a vested interest, whether it's... Uh, the World Trade Organization has no, a vested interest. No, 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 no. The, the, the countries we are negotiating with, the group of countries... I think Poland wants to sell machinery to us. Uh, the uh, Italians want to sell fashion goods to us. Uh, the, the Germans cars and engineering goods. Uh, the, the Spaniards and French want to sell... Uh, food and drink to us, and they all have surpluses in our direction. So they want to sell to us more than we want to sell right. to them. Can I just and, and I'm afraid, on that point? I'm afraid the negotiation will happen. Okay. And, you know, and, and, I just want but, to correct but, 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 one but thing that you but, keep saying. No, I'm going to correct. Let, let, let Caroline have let, the correction. No, wanna, let this, Caroline make the correction. All right, we'll come back. Fair. I want to correct the point where you keep saying that the EU needs us more than we need it. Our exports to the EU are 13% of our GDP. EU exports to Britain are 3% of yeah, their we GDP. Keep... We actually need them more than they need we, us. We... You are being incredibly we... complacent. We are being we... incredibly we... complacent. We... 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 This... This... No, no, no. Let, the... let... Let... let Caroline speak. The... The... The, the, the simple truth is that this negotiation is going to affect every country. They won't be doing a 3% deal. They'll be thinking about, what about my industry? What about this industry? We don't, we don't talk about the percentage deals we deal with. We look at what it means for our individual industries. And while we're at it, the, the suggestion by uh, Ed that, oh, well, we can deal with Europe and we can have a deal with China, we can't. Once we're, whilst we're inside the European Union, we cannot negotiate with China. We cannot negotiate with India. We cannot negotiate. All right, the I think you made the point, on David. Yes, you can. And uh, we will let do me, a better right, job David, than you've they spoken would. some time. Let's yeah. just uh, we must balance this up. Ed Miliband. I, I mean, look, I think Caroline rather exposed David's argument, but, but I think the, the other thing, David, that comes across is it is a massive leap into the unknown. I, I've read some of the things you said about this. You said we should be like Canada, but then people pointed out that actually the Canadian trade deal has taken eight years, it isn't complete, it's got tariffs, so you said, well, maybe we shouldn't be like Canada. Today you're saying, well, we sort of be like Norway or Switzerland in a speech you made, yeah. but not really like Norway or Switzerland. It's, it's some kind of unique status that only Britain is going to have, and you can't actually tell us the country well, we're going to be like. Okay. Which country would it be that, like? That's, that's which, that's, which country would it be like? That's because... <laughs> I mean, just tell us the country. Yeah. Ca Canada, yeah. Albania, Norway, Switzerland. The country we're going to be like is... The country we're going to be like is Great Britain. Right. Well, we're well, <laughs> This is, this is, this is the, this is... I mean, it's, this, I mean, it's this good is, rhetoric, this, but it's not this, an answer. This is, I'm afraid this is it's not stand, an answer, this David. This is the standard response. Every time, every time... Just, just, every time, just say one no, no, country, yes, yes, just country. one country, country whose trading arrangements we'd be like. It's every, a fair question. Every, every, time, every time we offer an example of something which works, they say, oh, you're going to be like them. So, 
uh, for example. Uh, the, 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 well, I have uh, lots of examples. He's talked about them. Switzerland, Canada. Not, is it, you don't want, all these, you don't want all, Switzerland, no, though, no, really, do what you? What we're saying is other, thi other countries prove that things can be done. But you, you don't can't have to be name like a single in country other than Great Britain whose trading arrangements with the EU will be like. I think that's really it's important all right. for the audience. There's no country in the whole world that has trading arrangements with the EU which he wants to, which he wants to emulate. Now, if that isn't a leap into the unknown and a massive risk, I don't know what it is. Steve Hilton. I don't think that one's I, going anywhere. Yeah, I, just, I, I want to say something on trade in a second, but just on this point of, of what's the alternative. I, the best thing that I've read about this, and I can't remember who said it, was that it is really the most stupid question hmm. out, which is what's the alternative the to being in... No, not the question here, the question that you pose, which is what's the alternative <laughs> to being in the EU. The old, hang on, the alternative to being in the EU is not being oh, in the EU. Goodness. And, and most of the countries... Like? Mo it looks like and most it looks of the like no environmental policy. It looks like getting rid of the social the chapter. It looks like chapter, having no actually. workers' most rights with, the... protected at EU level. Well, most of the countries in the world are not in the EU, yeah. and and they are doing better than the EU. Mm -hmm. Now, on the trade question. Um, I just wanted to offer. But can a you answer the question that he didn't answer, which is what He's got country? Right. The country that we'd be like is our own country. It's a yeah. 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 It's such a silly. Honestly, okay. yeah. please. Okay. I really, really wish that these politicians would just stop treating us like idiots. The point you're making is completely ridiculous. No, it isn't. Of course, it's it a very is. simple point. Would which you is, like our own as, country? No, but as we look around the world, Steve, it's a serious point. As we look around the world with the different trading arrangements, because trade is fundamental to this, what country do we want to emulate when it comes to our relationship outside the EU with the it's EU? The and there's no point in saying Britain, because we're in the EU at the moment we and in the single market. Okay. No, okay. sorry, can I just... Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, because just because there's a particular here. thing. I just wanted to offer a perspective on this question of this trading arrangements. Davis. All right. Because, because there's a particular vanity that I have noticed about politicians which is that they believe that the whole world revolves around what they decide and what they do, and they think that the only good things David that happen... Cameron like hang that, on a second. Then. David Cameron the, like the, that. The only, <laughs> he's the exception. He's the, the exception. Only, uh, the only good things in the world come from the decisions they make and the rules they do and the things that they set up. The truth is that our success as an economy, more than anything else, depends on something that is known as comparative advantage. In simple terms, are we designing and making things that the rest of the world wants to buy? That's within our control. And th that's the fundamental point here, that we need to make our economy more productive by the policies that we implement here in this country, and then that is what will lead to our success. OK. Thank you. I think that most people that are on the fence need to make a calculated decision. Yeah. And to do that, you need to calculate the risks. At least the Remain campaign is trying to quantify what it would be if we leave the EU. But what I hear from the um, exit campaign, all this airy fairy, follow, you, follow me into la la land type of conversations, <laughs> and I, I haven't heard anything, anything from you apart from Britain, Great Britain will be fine in the rest of the world. You know, we're going to be the Great Britain of old. I haven't heard anything, any, any real argument against that, or not against that, but for that. Okay. And, uh, Mr. Davis, I have to disagree with you. Government doesn't know best because the Tory government dismantled the NHS perfectly well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> the woman in the back in, in, in red. We've only got a few moments left. The woman in red there, at the very back. Yes. So, something that um, none of the politicians here have mentioned is the fact that the Germans have a black bank balance which roughly equals the sum of the total of the red bank balances in the other 27 countries. That, for me, speaks for itself. Yeah. Europe's good for Germany. OK. Um, and you, sir, up there, on the far right. Yeah. I just think Ed Miliband's comments are a classic example of the Remain camp Camp's um, position of doing our country down. We are the fifth largest economy in the world. And the sooner we get out, the better. Get our seat back onto the World Trade Organisation and get our identity back. Vote, leave. Okay. And you. The woman in grey there, yes. Um, you talked about um, 
the Remain Leave campaign using, um, treating people like idiots when the Leave campaign has used the most pathetic arguments for staying in. Boris Johnson's talking about how big, bana how big bunches of yeah. bananas can be. It's pathetic. I, I agree. I, I, I agree. I've, I've talked about both campaigns doing that, just to be clear. We, had a, we have a question. We don't have to take it, but it's what perhaps the panel comment on it. <laughs> Whether scare stories... Uh, are having a detrimental effect on people's perception of politics and also whether the Conservative Party can ever reunite after the, <laughs> the insults that they're hurling at each other. What do you think? Which of the Don't which smile. Would you like to ask? We answer any, either <laughs> question. I don't care which you answer. Well, of course it's going to be different. Perception of politics is being yes. diminished I mean, by I, the exaggeration I think, I think, I think and actually, the Tory party I think, I think together. Actually, that discuss. is a fair point. That the, the, this battle, to some extent, is diminishing confidence in, in, in politicians. I think there's no doubt that's true. Uh, and partly, uh, it, it's not just British politicians. I mean, I remember when Obama came over, he made his comments. There was a very short sort of 5% blip as people said, oh, yeah, oh, well, we, that, that's a, that, that, that frightens us. But then about a week later, they said, well, what's it got to do with him? And what does he know anyway? That, that, so there was a sort of clear resentment, really, and being told what to think and being told what to do and having these huge and unfounded scare stories run. So, yes, I do okay. take it on the uh, uh, Steve Hilton, do you think the Conservatives will be able to come back from an issue that so divided them? Uh, I do, um, because there are really important big things that the government wants to get done and that will go on afterwards. But I also wanted to comment on the question about politics because I think it's, it is really worrying what's happening. Um, I've talked earlier about the, the scare stories and the phony figures and all the rest of it and the fact that both campaigns, I think, are making this far too simple. But I think that what that really means is that people just are turned off by the whole thing. They don't want to go into politics at all. They don't want to participate. Mm -hmm. And, and there's, there's a point underlying it that I think is really important for us all to understand, which is why do they do it? These are smart people. They can see that what they're doing they is smart? ridiculous really? and silly. They are smart. <laughs> And they're mm. well-intentioned, and they're good people on all sides. They want to do the best. Mm. And they know that this stuff is ridiculous, even mm. as they're saying it. But isn't and that the, a bit the rich question coming why from you? Yeah, of course, I've owned you, you, up to my role You did that, didn't you? Completely. Devil owned, eyes, what was that Absolutely. Thing? Before Blair, that, Labour's tax bombshell, you'd paid £1,000. I've been involved in all this stuff, OK, for years. And I can now, with a bit of detachment, see and own up to the fact that that has been a trend that I think has been damaging and it's got worse and worse in this campaign. Hang on one second. No, we've I think got to that, stop, actually. Well, I just so think, well, but very quick. The, the, wait, wait a second. The, the, very thing, quick. the thing is that, that actually what they're counting on is that you are not sufficiently interested in the serious arguments and that you will fall for it because they believe that you want simple, superficial yeah, well, things. The evidence you've of, got to show them all right. that that is not true. Well, the evidence of the Question Time audience is that, that the exact opposite, which is people are absolutely fascinated by the audience, exactly. by the arguments. But, but that's why they need to stop A, a very them. quick word, because we yeah, really yeah, are over time yeah, now. Because yeah. I'm a non-politician here. I'm not even a Westminster mm -hmm. insider. And one of the reasons that I decided to leave was all the politicians, they were just arguing amongst themselves, and it was men, it wasn't women, men predominantly from down south, wasn't a geographical spread of people. I turned my TV off and I went and did my own research, and that's how I got to the position okay. that I got to. And Ed, Ed. <laughs> yeah, very brief. All right, that comes in. Very brief, so, 30 seconds. My, my 30 second pitch is that I do think that this campaign desperately needs more optimism and it needs totally. more vision. And totally. I want to say that I think it is actually quite extraordinary totally. that 28 countries that until very recently actually used to try to solve their problems by fighting by bullets and bombs totally. are now actually trying to find their solutions through discussion and debate. Sometimes it might be a bit cumbersome, but actually it's a better way of doing things. Okay. Do you want to just say, so be it? Do you agree? I, I agree with Caroline. Look, there has been too okay. much negativity on both sides of this argument, World War III and Hitler That's on each right, side of the right. argument. Okay. Uh, and actually, there is a positive vision of a, an EU that works for people and is changed on climate change, on tax avoidance, on prosperity, on all of those things. I don't like the EU the way it is. We've got to change it and make it better. OK, so thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we, I'm sorry, and 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 I'm sorry. Our hours up, unfortunately. Well, now, we're going to be in Cardiff next week. We have uh, Frank Field for Labour. We have Neil Hamilton, uh, the former Tory MP, now UKIP's leader in the Welsh Assembly. 
and the Folkestone the week after that. So if you want to come either to Cardiff or Folkestone, or remember the week after that, those three sites, Nottingham, York and Milton Keynes, go to our website, or you can call the number 0330123998. Five live listeners, as you know, this debate carries on to the early hours, uh, but here our time's up. I'm sad about it. Our panel, I thank them very much indeed for coming, and to all of you who came to Ipswich or come from Ipswich to be here tonight, many thanks. Until next Thursday, from Question Time, good night. Thank you.